Fox Army. Mr. J.D. Burke is with us. Hi, J.D. How's your Friday going? So far, so good. How about yours? It's going well. Botch is carrying me yeah, through the I week. Mean, I'm, I, I can carry you. Carrying me through I'll the week, you. Mr. Botch. Thank you. <laughs> me and little eggs and avocado, and I think you'll be okay, bro. Just don't, uh, don't microwave up. your coffee. Don't microwave your coffee, well, J.D. You know, I, tr I trust J.D. in a lot of different areas, but but one of uh, one of the main ones uh, are his takes on, uh, on Utica and Jake for 10 and spent a lot of time there last year. JD, I've put together what I what I think possibly could be the opening night roster. One of the uh, one of my picks is generating uh, substantial controversy. People think that I'm wrong that there's no chance of this happening. I have Jake Furtan and playing right wing on my fourth line. JD, what uh, what do you think? What do you think of that? Oh, I see you like to live dangerously. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you doubt me? I'm, you I'm... doubt Jake? Yeah, I, I have some concerns about his readiness to play at the NHL level. I think a lot of the problems that forced him out of the Canucks lineup at the beginning of the season are still there. He's still somebody who struggles to, to process the game at a professional level. And, and we noticed that last year. I mean, I think the biggest difference for Jake Furtanen from, from this year to the year before was that the Canucks instituted a lot more structure. And then that requires being able to think the game, knowing your lanes and where to go. And I think that's why he's struggling. Some of his underlying metrics reflected that. So I, I still worry about whether he's ready to make that jump yet. And I think the problem is if, if you start him off on the fourth line and he gets off to a bad start or he has another year like last year, you might create a situation where he becomes something of a write-off and you start hearing the bust word throwing ar thrown around. Well, so, we, already, we already hear that. I mean, yeah, that, 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 We're already there. True. But that would be the final nail in the coffin. <laughs> and the think? Canucks have way too much riding on this pick to, uh, to kind of risk that. And I just think that from a, a cost-risk kind of uh, lens, like what's the added benefit of having Vertanen on your fourth line as opposed to having him in Utica for another year where he's going to get top minutes, you know, play on the power play, the penalty kill. I think that the Canucks should have development first and foremost, and Utica is probably the best option for Bertanen in that regard. Well, there's certainly an argument to be made that developing players, young players on a fourth line can work. And uh, and look, he was he was really good for stretches in that first year when he was playing for Willie. He was very effective. The problem that I that I had with him in Utica watching, you know, I probably didn't watch as many games as you. I didn't see that physical Jake, right? Like I didn't see that Jake that's you know getting big hits uh, in and around the net. I didn't see a lot of rebound goals. The type of you know, kind of power forwardy things that you would hope to see from someone like that. Uh, did you see it similarly? And and if so, why not? Like, where where is that side of his game gone? Well, I, I think in general, there's kind of been, and, and the Canucks are in part responsible for this. I think people kind of have a misconception about what Jake Vertanen is. He's somebody who plays a physical game, but he's not what I would describe as a power forward. And I think this year was kind of a return to form for Vertanen. When you watched him in his draft year at Calgary, he's somebody who is like, he's more of a bull rush kind of player, right? But he would never take the puck to the net. He would shoot from a lot of perimeter areas. And that was kind of part of the concern with his gaudy goal totals was like, how many of these goals are repeatable at the NHL level? And so I think he's somebody who can be physical. He can impose his will on players. But I don't see him as sort of a net front presence. I see him as somebody whose best asset is his shot. And, and, I think when you have him in front of the net, you don't give him the opportunity to use his speed and his shot perhaps as much as you should with a player with his skill set. Okay, so you're out on Vertanen. Uh, another guy that's going to have a very difficult time making this team because of the numbers is Nikolai Goldobin. He turns 22 in October. And I say to you, J.D., if not now, then when? Like, Are you surprised at all that the team really had? There's no obvious spot for him in this lineup anytime soon. Yeah, I, th I think that is kind of the problem with some of their free agency decisions is that it's kind of forced it's kind of forced Goldobin to the peripheries of the lineup. I think he's somebody, though, who should get a shot. Like, he, he's cut his teeth at the AHL level. He's shown just about everything he can at that level. And, and I agree with your sentiment that it's sort of it's now or never. I think there's a – people have this idea of players when they reach their peak and it's in their late 20s. The reality is that players peak offensively closer to 24 or 25. 
right? So if he's somebody you can't even cut it at the NHL level in a secondary scoring role at 22, you start to really wonder, like, is he ever going to be able to do that? And I think the only way to find out is to give him reps. And and I think the Canucks have kind of put themselves into a, a tough situation here with some of the uh, the signings they've, they've made that have kind of closed that option to them. So it'll be interesting to see where he lands. I'd like to see him get a top six role, but only time will tell. I thought it odd, like at the end of last year, if Ole Olevi's uh, OHL season had ended, there was an opportunity for, there could have been an opportunity for him to play Canucks games. But the Canucks said no, that they weren't going to do that. They didn't feel Ole Levy was ready. Uh, and uh, and then there was talk not long after that that there was a change that some in management believed that he should be given a chance uh, to make the team this fall. Uh, again, the numbers dictate and the, the veterans that they've brought in dictate that that is going to be very difficult. It's, it's almost impossible. Like, I don't really see a path, even if he's great and impresses, I don't see a path for him to be in the lineup early in the season on opening night and beyond. And then he, you know, the, the choices are go back to Europe or uh, go back to London. Um, are you surprised with that one? And two, do you think Yo Levy has the talent and ability, even at this age, strength, to do what Hutton and Stetcher did, although older, uh, the previous two training camps, and that's really impress? Yeah, I, I am a bit surprised that they've kind of, again, it's it's sort of like Old Oban. They've just closed any openings for Yule Levy to sort of make the team. It's, it's a peculiar decision because Yule Levy is, is, he had a fine year in London. Like, I don't see any reason why you would look at his last season and think to yourself that he's not at the very least knocking on the door of an NHL job. And strictly from a PR perspective, if you don't even give him the opportunity, it doesn't necessarily look good when you've got just about every defense been taken after him in the first round getting a shot, whether it's, um, like, uh, what's the name? Mikhail Sergachev got a chance. Uh, Jacob Chikrin was taking reps. They had Charlie McAvoy playing big minutes in Boston. And I think that the Canucks are almost selling their own prospects short by not giving him a chance to show his worth. And and when you look at the way he finished the season in London, I think there's, like, people have a, the wrong idea about his season. They look at his point totals and they see somebody who plateaued. Uh, he actually produced at a very similar rate to Mikhail Sergachev, and he's somebody that we generally consider as an offensive, defensive prospect who's got top pair potential. So there's no reason to look at his last year and think that he's not close to NHL ready at the very least. And another thing to consider about Yu Levy is that he was playing with a 16-year-old defenseman as a partner which speaks to the trust that uh, Dale Hunter has for him in London. And and I think it kind of puts his, his production and some of his work in a new light. Like, that's a very difficult circumstance to, to have to play in, especially when you're playing such significant minutes against top competition. And based on my viewings, I thought he fared admirably. I really think that this is a player who should be in the Canucks opening night roster, but I just wonder if it works logistically. Uh, another guy who who maybe depending on wh- where you stand should be on the Canucks opening r- roster is Brock Besser, who was really good in those nine games, scored four goals, pr- maybe could have had more, uh, can definitely be a threat uh, on the power play. Um, I if I were the Canucks, I'd have him playing with Berchi and Horvat. Uh, but there is another factor, like I think that spot is going to be, you know, I think you can put Goldobin maybe in that mix. Definitely Anton Rodin. I think Canucks Army was a big proponent of the idea of bringing Rodine back. I don't see a lot of upside in Rodine. I'd rather have Besser do that. But do you think that they needed, you know, is that is that part of this, that they needed Besser insurance, and that's one reason to have Anton Rodine come back? Well, I, I've never really made that straight line connection, but the one point I would make about Rodine from, from when they signed him for last season as opposed to this one is, is what's really changed? I don't think anything has changed for Rodin. He had a knee injury, but he's still the same player that they wanted to pry from Sweden. And some of the reasons they wanted to pry him was because he was extremely productive. And if you run NHL equivalencies on his numbers, which is basically a way to look at his SHL production and frame it in the light of what he would do in the NHL based on that season, he's somebody who checks out as scoring at 40 to 50 points, somewhere in that range. So... I think last year is just a write-off. And I think he's still the same player that the Canucks wanted to get when they pried him from Sweden in the 2015-16 season. So I think it's worth it to give him another chance, and especially on such a low-value deal. I mean, I just don't see there being any 
any risk here and, and a huge reward potential. Well, I would say one As, thing has changed. I mean, that, that it was serious knee surgery that he had to, to kind of try to uh, try to fix a chronic or, you know, problem that he had uh, a deficiency in his knee from birth. Uh, and something that kept him out for months. So, I mean, we don't yet know how if he's going to be the same guy that he was. That's that's fair, but I, I still think the upside is there. That that's kind of my my take on this is that there's enough upside to make him worth the one way contract risk. You, you've you've tracked Besser. Uh, you know, a lot see him as the team's number one prospect. Do you see it that way? And do you think he's ready now to be playing NHL games regularly? You know, not for a couple of weeks, but for a season. I think the uh, the addition of Elias Pettersson to the Canucks prospect pool kind of throws a wrench in that. I don't know if Besser is right. still the best prospect in their system, but he's still a he's a great player. And I think his his what was it nine games last season really showed some of what he's capable of. And you look at the way he produced goals, the way he helped drive, play at even strength. He was doing all that with a wrist injury. Like his wrist was taped up something fierce. And I wonder what's he going to do when he has a full off season of health, right? Because all of last season he was nursing that wrist injury. It's what forced him to miss the world juniors. So I look at a player who's just scratching the surface. And, and again, Brock Besser is somebody who, uh, if everything goes well, he should be in the Canucks opening night roster. And he's somebody who I think he can even make a difference. I don't think he's a project. I think he showed last season that he's ready to play and ready to contribute. And and especially on that Besser, Horvat, and Berchi line, I think they have something going there. And speaking of Bo Horvat, still remains unsigned. Obviously, the two sides uh, have been, you know, I think it's fair to say significantly far apart. And that's part of the reason the Canucks said after the year that it's something that they expect to take all uh, take most of the summer. After seeing some of the signings that we we experienced and saw in July, uh, does it change your view at all of what you think Horvat should be making, uh, specifically maybe on a six-year deal? I, I think absolutely, and I think that one signing in particular that's kind of impacted the, the Horvat negotiations is, is Tyler Johnson. Tyler Johnson's older. Uh, if memory serves, I think he was arbitration eligible. He's somebody right. who has a a history of scoring at a higher level than Horvat has a better two way impact than Horvat. And he settled for 5 million on a long-term deal that buys UFA years. So if you're the Canucks, you got to be sending Steve Weiserman some flowers because that deal sets a ceiling on what you can put on Horvat's contract. Cause there's no way you can compare Bo Horvat to a Tyler Johnson. Certainly not at this juncture. Right. So I think with that in mind, the Canucks actually have a lot of leverage in this situation and, and, it's it's interesting because the way RFA years work is that if they sign to a one or a two year deal, really it's kind of a continuous deal with team options, right? So it's not like he's not going to get security here. So I think what they might go for is probably a bridge contract, and and maybe they just keep qualifying him because it's it's really hard to get a read on what Horvat is. He's produced like a first line center certainly last season, but if you want to look at some of the underlying data, he was one of the Canucks' worst defensive players especially when you take into account shot quality metrics. He's somebody who is just, it's contrary to his reputation from junior has really struggled to help his team defensively at even strength. So if you factor in all these contextual pieces of information, you, you kind of wonder like, is he really going to get that 5 million that people were talking about earlier? Or is it more realistic to expect him to come in at four and a half, four and a quarter for one or two years, a couple more show me years. Have, have they put him in situations to succeed, I, you know, considering quality of competition? Like, are there better ways to shelter him at evens? Well, I, I do wonder about that. It's, it's, it's a tough situation for the Canucks, right? Because, I mean, who are they going to use to shelter Horvat? Well, that's why <laughs> I think you're in, Sutter, I mean, specifically. That's why, that's why you get Sutter. Yeah, exactly. But then the problem is you have Sutter who's just getting, you know, he's not faring incredibly well at even strength. I think he controlled 43% of all unblocked shot attempts last year when the, when he was on the ice, that's how many the Canucks controlled. And if that's who you're using to protect Bill Horvat, then you're going to have significant issues at even strength. So, I mean, I, I think there's something to be said for the quality of competition Bill Horvat's face and the impact that's had. But I don't think it accounts for, for all of the negative impact he's had defensively. I think it, it matters, but not enough to kind of wash away some of his negative underlying results. 
Jay, did you see another level next year, maybe how high for Marcus Granlin? You got 19 out of Granlin last year and certainly showed flashes. Uh, where do you see him going in the near future? I, I think Granlin did a lot to really convince me of his worth as a player last year, and he's somebody that I was very skeptical of. I mean, when when he came over from Calgary, it's, it's not like he hadn't had the opportunity to produce. He, he had significant opportunities in Calgary. And then something just clicked last year in Vancouver. And it's not just his goal scoring, which was great. I think that he's somebody who's probably going to be right around the 19-20 goal range, right? But I think what was most impressive to me was the impact he had on the Canucks' ability to control goals and shots at even strength. And that's the kind of thing that goes towards winning hockey games. His defensive game was among the best on the Canucks last year. And, and the further you deep, the more you realize that he really brought a lot to this team in terms of controlling the flow of play. Well, his brother was getting all the accolades, obviously, early in the year. And then by the end of the year, I'm thinking, well, you know what? Marcus not maybe hidden out here in Vancouver to a degree. but uh, And the way he came on, certainly. Not, not that he was uh, warranted great reviews earlier. But suddenly it looked like you might have some, <laughs> yeah, you have some with him. Erickson can't possibly be as bad offensively this year as last year, can he? And I, the Twins aren't getting any faster. But uh, there is, there's some glimmers here, I would, I would think. And Granlin's on the list. Yeah, and and getting back to your Erickson point, Erickson was just so unlucky last season. I mean, I remember one game the Canucks were playing against Nashville. I think he hit three posts. <laughs> it was just like, it was kind of a snapshot into his season. He's somebody who was starting to get chances, and then it, it just for whatever reason, he had a really down year. I, I think if you went into the, the Erickson contract thinking that the player he was in his last year in Boston is what you're getting, then you're mistaken. He's never going to be a 30-goal scorer again. It's uh, He just had a lucky year, and, and last year he had a very unlucky year. And I would expect, though, that he bounces back to about 20 goals, 50 points, and continues to be a really strong defensive player for the Canucks. Like I, I'm not as worried as most are about, about what he's going to be able to provide in the short term. I mean, that certainly doesn't necessarily certainly doesn't justify the contract, but I still think he's going to be a good player next year, and I'm not as concerned. Thanks, J.D. Appreciate it, my friend. Uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us here on a Friday morning. Uh, uh, very nice to talk to you, my friend. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. The pride of the Canucks Army, that's J.D. Burke. 